Good morning. Hi, it's Rob Hopkins here. I've got up for the Dawn Chorus, which is absolutely beautiful this morning. I'll just give you a little a few seconds of listening to it. And I wanted to read you the passage out of uh, From What Is to What If, which is about getting up to listen to the Dawn Chorus, uh, the beginning of chapter 3, which is called What If We Followed Nature's Lead? When was the last time you heard the Dawn Chorus? I don't mean the last time you happened to be awake after leaving a window open. I mean, when was the last time you deliberately woke up before dawn sometime between February and early June, and went outside just before sunrise, simply to listen. I'm racking my brains to think of the last time I did something like this. I tend to think of the da of dawn as a time for deep sleep, not sitting in misty early morning fields. Still, one morning, one May morning in May in 2018, I had to pry myself out of bed at 4 a.m. As the writer Henry Porter once wrote, this is easily achieved by drinking a lot of water the night before, to take part in Dawn Chorus Day on the Dart at Dartington Hall Trust Estate near Totnes. Dawn Chorus Day is an annual event held on the first Sunday of May and it has its roots sometime in the early 1980s when the broadcaster and environmentalist Chris Baines hosted his birthday party at 4am so his guests could enjoy the morning song. The art collective Sound Camp now coordinates a 24-hour live recording of the Dawn Chorus and uploads this reveal so anyone can listen to the music of morning spreads around listen as the music of morning spreads around the world. The collective also organizes a network of sound camps where people can participate in real life. My local camp is run by the community radio station Sound Art Radio. Now in its third year, the camp brings together sound recordists, artists and the simply curious for a weekend that includes workshops on field recording, yoga, body work and a wildlife disco to make, quote, good use of all the vinyl rec wildlife recordings we have between us, including screaming rabbits, whining squirrels and whistling otters. Plus, of course, there's that early morning wake-up call. It's still dark when our seven-person group gathers in a small car park near where we've been camping. It's quiet, apart from a few robins tricked by streetlights into an early start. It's cool, but not cold. All seven of us are focused, purposeful, intent. We set off together on a ten minute walk. As we walk, we hear some of the other early risers, the first blackbirds, and as we head down the hill through open farmland, the song of a skylark high above. Our destination is a bend in the river Dart, with woodlands on the other side, stretching as far as the eye can see. By the time we reach it, the chorus has begun in earnest. The invitation and challenge from Tony Whitehead, the ornithologist and sound recordist leading the walk, is to just listen, to be still and enjoy the remarkable concert. I make myself as comfortable as I can, leaning against, an old, leaning, leaning against an oak tree and sitting on my raincoat. A thin layer of mist sits above the surface of the river. Soon we hear robins, then blackbirds and song thrushes. They're joined by wrens, wood pigeons and crows. There's a mandarin duck with its distinctive squelchy sounding call. There are mallard, there's a mallard duck, long-tailed tits, chiff-chaffs and chaffinches, plus the occasional pheasant. Soon the song of the blackbird arrives in two halves. The first half is roughly the same each time, its signature, if you like. In the second they improvise, something different each time. I'm reminded of Charlie Parker, whose nickname, ironically, was Bird, who said, you've got to learn your instrument. Then you practice, 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 and then when you finally get up there on the bandstand, Forget all that and just wail. This morning I'm, I'm hearing nature's improvisation. Jazz birds. 
The dawn chorus plays in pulses of intensity, something I'm vaguely aware of as I listen, but which is unmistakable when I look at the peak and trough sound profile of the recording afterwards. Apart from the occasional plane going over, or a distant motorbike, we're treated to an intense, spectacular recital. The dawn chorus, Tony explained to us the previous evening, happens between February and June, reaching its height in May. What we're hearing is almost entirely male birds. In order to attract the female of their species, they're letting the world know, I'm here, this is my territory, and I'm so able to feed myself, and I'm so strong and so great, that I can be awake and make this fine, powerful song. It's the woodland community communicating with itself. When a woman points out similarities with social media, Tony agrees, saying the wood was literally tweeting. As we listen to the chorus, I recall how Tony explained that when birds notice dangers or threats, they have different calls. An experienced bird watcher can follow the passage of people or animals through a forest just by listening to the calls. After 50 minutes, the chorus drops from its peak to a background noise as the birds become peckish and ready for breakfast. We featherless ones gather to reflect on the experience. My companions are clearly affected by what they've heard. Tony notes that although he's heard many dawn choruses, he never tires of it and urges us all to make the effort whenever possible. You only get so many maize in your life, he observes. Later he tells me, the richness of the experience is just remarkable. I've had people say that it's been on the edge of life-changing. For some, it can, be a very, it can be genuinely a very, very deep experience. Indeed, for months afterwards, I find myself much more aware of birdsong. It's as though my time by the river tuned me in. I now notice it everywhere I go. That early morning walk gave me a deep re reconnection to the natural world and its diversity. The alertness it engenders, the opportunity for, for undistracted attention was reward enough, but it also boosted my imagination in a palpable way. In the days and weeks that followed, I noticed that my writing followed easier, flowed easier. I was, in general, less distracted. The magic of that morning carried over into my life. Even many months later, as I write this, I find myself affected by the richness of it in my day-to-day -day life. I might not be able to identify a given bird, but I notice them in a way I didn't before, and I also feel a bit more present, a bit more in the world. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your dawn chorus.